guest, Karun Ali. It's not bad. It's not bad. You got you got more moves on you. I don't know why you're putting pressure on our guests to have more moves when I've been doing the same move (laughs) literally every week for six weeks. I mean, I feel like we deserve credit because we actually told the guest about doing the dance this week uh, when normally we just kind of let them flounder. Mm. I appreciate the heads up. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome, Haroon. Um, Do you have any thoughts on public transit in Canada and specifically in Edmonton? I do actually. What's called? I want. Yeah, I thought we were talking uh, about Calgary. What? Uh, you I know, thought we I brought Haroon on specifically to talk about Calgary. Yeah. Calgary. I think you guys got the wrong city council candidate here. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things I've been loving about Edmonton is that we got this new little card. It's called our card. So uh, basically, with these little cards, I can hop on any train, bus, anything I want. Tap it. Uh, one of the good things too is that I am a University of Alberta student, so I get a U pass. So I only have to pay 180 bucks in a semester, and I get to hop on public transit. But one of the bigger things for me, and this is something I ran on when I was running for city council, is that public transit should be free. Public transit, I think, is not something that should be charged, because the problem that we have, and the problem that major cities around the world have, is that people don't want to take transit. The incentive is not to give out these cards to people, being like, cool, pay, pay us... Uh, and create a pay-as-you-go system. I think the alternative is that we have a free public transit system. People can rely on, people can use when they want to. And by doing so, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be actually lowering emissions. We're going to actually be making sure that we're getting, we're going to actually save money too, in a sense, because now if there's less vehicles on the roads, that means less money spent on road repairs. That means less money spent on who knows what? <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, what's called public free public transit makes good sense. And I think it's something that we should be looking at too. I know lots of cities across the United States have actually implemented these plans. And I hope Edmonton does it soon. Cool. Yeah. yeah oh, and I... actually, uh, fun... go ahead. Sorry, fun fact actually. Uh, the Boston mayor who got elected, oh, she actually ran on free transit. So oh. I'm hopeful to see maybe Boston be the ma- uh, first major city in North America to do it. Cool. Yeah, I was not aware that they were implementing that in the states anywhere. That's fantastic. So, Hi. like, what kind of? Uh, let, let's. I'll, I'll fill in this context a bit for you know anyone that watches that may not know. So, you ran uh, as a city council candidate um, in uh, Ward Papasteo, right? Yes. Okay, good. I, it's a good thing I didn't forget because that was my ward. So you, uh, yeah, you ran, you ran in our ward, and uh, so like the free transit was part of your campaign, right? Yeah, it was a so, cornerstone of the campaign. Yeah. So what kind of responses did you actually get from people like when talking about that? I'll be honest. Free transit was one of the less controversial ideas on my platform. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you think about think about it like this. Imagine uh, what's called, um, if someone came to you with a radical platform, free transit was kind of on the bottom of that list, <laughs> luckily. So it kind of slid mm-hmm. without pass, but I think a lot of folks know it's time for free transit. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense to essentially, we're losing so much money on public transit why not make it a free public service that people can rely on? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, even for me, I don't even understand the need to have transit peace officers running around transit at nighttime, kicking folks out of the shelters, kicking them back out into the cold. It's, once again, we're, we're expensing money that we don't actually need to, when instead we could be actually investing money back into the system to make the system better, to make the system reliable. We can be spending this money on oh, shelters. We can be spending this money on giving people uh, rapid housing, getting people supportive housing. But once again, it kind of goes back to mismanagement of our priorities. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I um, I think especially, too, that's this idea that, like, some people don't... I mean, this hap- this is for lots of things, but some people don't deserve that. Like, oh, I have to pay for it, or I have to earn my right to do these things. So, like, you know, other, like if you're not paying for it, like, why should I have to pay for someone else to do those things? And then also, I think Alberta, too, has a bit of a driving culture. And so, yeah, 
um, we have a bit of a driving culture. And so it's, I think it's, it's kind of built in there. And so a lot of people are like, well, I don't take transit. So why should I, my tax money go towards that? That's why it's part of so, such a problematic thing to bring up. Or exactly. and, about. and the irony in this too, is that, and this is something that's always, always made me chuckle. Uh, what's called is that essentially every single time we talk about cost sharing different things, the first thing that people bring up is that they immediately say, why should I pay for it? Like you said, but we co-pay for so many different things and co-paying makes better financial sense. Why should we bankrupt someone with a, let's say hypothetically, and this is one of the reasons why I'm very thankful that in Canada we have public health care because I should, if I get a $30,000 bill in what's called health care bill at once, that could very well bankrupt me. But over my lifetime, if I'm paying 50 bucks a month into a health care fund and I have an accident, that's what it's there for. It's to make sure that people can actually survive. And yes, does that mean the rich are going to pay more? Of course. But at the end of the day, you know, what I mean? it's about paying your fair share and it's about helping everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the government equivalent of Josh's mom stowing his mon- a little bit of his paycheck away every month so that he can uh, be able to retire when he's, you know, a decent age. Smart. Josh's mom is, is saving that money for him. <laughs> yeah, she's a wonderful lady. Uh, I um, go ahead. So, like, yeah, on that note about, um, because, like, I mean, a lot of the arguments you're making, I mean, to me, more or less, you're preaching to the choir. If you, especially when, you know, as you've alluded to, there's, um, there's so many of these uh, situations where you can point to it and say we're wasting money. Uh, It costs, like, all of us collectively in the wrong, in the long run, more to do it the way we're doing it. Uh, than it would be to try this new quote unquote radical thing. Um, one I'm you know intimately familiar with is that you know all of the downstream costs of homelessness uh, they add up to more than it would cost to simply house someone. And so you would think kind of the you know just based on the way you're presenting the argument that that should win over the fiscal conservatives right there. Like you're not even getting into the, the, you know, the morals of ending homelessness or you're not even getting into um, just the the emotional idea that like a city should be accessible. Uh, But as you probably know, people are still resistant and it almost seems like uh, I'll use the example of homelessness. You can make that, um very like financial numerical argument to people and they will kind of like solemnly nod their head but they'll still find a reason to be against it and to me like me i don't know if you'll agree but it feels like often on their end it's a moral argument that like they have this internal idea that like well you can't just give someone a house for free right they have to you know pick your argument they have to work for it and i think that is kind of how people are with transit too. The why should I pay for something I don't use? They're they're not they're not wanting to see like the financial balance sheet. They just it, it's like uh, they're operating on kind of like a moral and emotional level there. So, like, would you kind of agree with that or? Yeah, no, and no, and you know, I mean, for me, what's called um, this concept came to me very clearly. I, I don't know, if, I don't know if you, if you uh, or anyone has had a chance. Have, have you ever watched New Amsterdam? It's a TV show on Netflix. No. no. So it's about a doctor in New York. Uh, what's called he manage he becomes the medical director at uh, New Amsterdam, and basically he starts realizing that they uh, he he basically starts delving into the American health care system. But for one really good example was that they had someone that was repeatedly coming into the hospital. The reason why he was coming into the hospital was because he needed shelter. So basically, what he was doing was lying to stay in a warm place. Right, right, and what ended up happening was that he ended up racking up a three million dollar bill, right? And unfortunately, uh, what's called unfortunately, because he was unhoused, he didn't have insurance, until the hospital had to assume that cost. So rather than rather than letting him keep coming back, what they did instead was that they actually they actually got him an apartment, they got him a job working in the hospital as well. For you and and and, and so what I'm saying is that. People, some people need a hand up, you know what I mean? Like, and at the end of the day, 
I think it's our job as a society members to help people get the hand up. And at the end of the day, we shouldn't be punishing. We shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't be punishing people. We should be looking at ways to actually give them support so that they can actually learn something, so that they can actually do something. And once again, it's not our it's not our responsibility to shove it down people's throats. It's our responsibility to show it, I guess, <laughs> in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, I guess my question on that note is. You know, again, like everything you're saying makes perfect sense to me. It's very like I'm on board with it, but it sounds like when when you are trying to put those pitches to people like to a voting base in the real world, you still encounter a lot of resistance. So like, is there something you've learned so far through activism and community organizing in terms of like, well, what is going to change someone's mind in terms of the messaging? Because like a lot of people have been making those very well thought out detail oriented uh arguments that like this is the right thing to do this is a cost effective thing to do this is a more you know efficient thing to do this will this and that and it doesn't it it still seems to like reach a limited group of people so like have you have you found ways that like you can kind of reach the undecided or that you can sway people who are resistant or on the fence that's kind of my question yeah, uh, you know, what I mean, for me, what's called something I even noticed that the city council campaign was that something I continually talked about was policing, police funding. Uh, you know, what I mean, I chatted with a lot of folks about this, and and this is something that a lot of folks, especially in some in the suburbs, weren't too happy about. And actually, I even got threatened about. Uh, someone decided to threaten me about it, saying that he's ought to bash my head in for thinking of an idea like that. But you know, what I mean, so there's people like that, obviously. But uh, there's also other people, too, that are willing to actually have a conversation. Like, the people that are not willing to have a conversation about their views, it's useless. Like, I would suggest not even wasting your time with that. There's, like, you can typically tell this in about five minutes, less than five minutes, and having a conversation. There's also, also, I think there's also another group of people, too, where people, like, they have an idea. It's just a flawed idea. And they, they want to learn. They, wanna, they, they, they know better to an extent. They just don't know how to express that. Finally, I think there's people that are undecided, you know what I mean, where people don't really have an opinion on the issue. So for me, what's called my main target, it was actually ironically never the undecided. It was always the people that were in the middle. Because I think at the end of the day, you know what I mean, if you can convince those people, undecided people are simple. You know I mean? <laughs> it's really simple to get your point across and have these conversations too. But for me, when I knocked on doors, I had tons and tons of conversations, even volunteers. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the, at the end of the time, what's called most volunteers, some of the volunteers came in was saying they weren't too sure about my plan to what's called reinvest police funding back into communities. By the end, they were completely sure of it because at the end of the day, having a conversation with someone, having this, having an idea like repeated, having an idea actual logically thought through makes sense to people. I, 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 yeah, I'd be interested if you wanted to talk more about the police reform thing because, uh, you know, like during the election, something that I noticed when I was going through the, you know, all of the different uh, Ward Papasteo candidates and like one of the major reasons that I like truly genuinely uh, nearly voted for you was because you were the only person who Aww. mentioned the police. <laughs> I, and I, I, I kind of got sucked into the strategic voting feeling, but uh... of course, no, that's okay. And most <laughs> people did too, but no. <laughs> there was something no, you said honestly. earlier, Kelly, that I was like, "That sounds like he's uh, telling on himself about not voting for our guest." But oh, I'm absolutely yeah. telling on myself, and I, <laughs> I could the... use, I could use that as a springboard to say this is why we should have ranked choice voting so that we can kind of like really put our favorite vote forward and then kind of, you know, strategize who we really want and don't want um, out of all the candidates. But I mean, maybe that's a whole other conversation because I do, I do want to hear like you expand on the police reform thing. If you yeah. Uh, no, honestly, what's called, uh, well, first off, don't worry. I don't hold nothing against you as long as you didn't vote for the conservative candidate. <laughs> but uh, no, when it comes down to the fact, you know what I mean? I think at the end of the day, when it comes to it is that, Police reform, and this is something that's been a big topic for the past couple of years. And I mean, like, we've had lots of conversations since George Floyd. We've had lots of conversations since Dante Wright. And at the end of the day, I think that it makes logical sense to look and analyze the situation. If we're dispatching a police officer to self, to an unhoused person, is that an effective way to use resources? 
Or would it make more sense to get a care team with trained social workers to that person, get them to a shelter. If they don't want to get to a shelter, give them supplies, give them a blanket, give them, give, give them tools to actually live, to actually have basic necessities. You know what I mean? So that's, and that's something that I had this discussion with time and time and time after the campaign was that cost efficiency, you know what I mean? And this is something that's ironic because, you know, I, I, you would think conservatives, especially when they talk about tightening the budget, tightening your belts, they will talk about the police budget. But time and time after, again, no one's talked about the police budget. And in the past uh, four years, under the past city council, the police budget increased 28%. And, you know what I mean? And it was actually scheduled to increase another... I think three percent, but uh, luckily, what's called the uh, what's called uh, the other really strong police candidate in the, uh, what's called in this district, uh, Ward Papaseo, Michael Jans, actually really led the charge on it, and he was actually able to convince most of council to uh, agree to uh, they they basically they defunded the free, the increase, so they didn't defund the police, and this is something that they're very highly mis. Conception, <laughs> and mm -hmm. actually, ironically, they ended up giving the police an, an extra million dollars too. But at the end of the day, at least they got somewhere. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you got to settle somewhere, I guess. So yeah, like because you mentioned uh, at least like the, the example of you know being threatened by somebody when you brought it up. Um, certainly, it's a divisive issue when it comes up with voters. Uh, with that being such like a visible part of your campaign platform being on your website in the election, did you have any interactions with like a anyone representing the police? Like, did they talk to you? Did they, was there anything happening there? Uh, nope. They, they, unfortunately they never reached out. I actually really hope they would. <laughs> uh, we actually, ironically, our team actually reached out to the police. We, we reached out asking if we could do what's called, if we could have a sit down, if we could have a conversation with someone from the police Unfortunately, they didn't bite. I think most likely this is because of what's called back in April. I was heavily, no, June. I was heavily involved with Black Lives Matter, even back in June 2020. And mm -hmm. even this year too, you know, I mean, I was involved in several different protests in front of the, in front of EPS headquarters. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing they, they're not my best friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm, I, can, I can be like Casey Madu and call the police chief and get one of my tickets waived. <laughs> That's actually, that was one of the things I was going to ask about, because I noticed you've been tweeting and sharing a lot of things about that. Um, do you want to, I guess, for anyone that hasn't heard yet, because that's fairly recent, um, do you want to maybe elaborate a little bit on what's what went on there? And Yeah. Uh, well, our good old friend, Mr. Madhu, got into some trouble <laughs> the other day. What's called, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Madhu decided to, uh, well, back in, no, not the other day, actually, this is a year ago. Yeah, actually, yeah, about nine months ago, he ended up calling the police chief because he got ticketed outside of a in the school zone uh, near his home, and he he allegedly said he didn't call the police chief to get the ticket waived. He called them to talk about racial profiling. Here's the irony in all of this. Once again, when Black Lives Matter said police are racially profiling us, Casey Madu said no, they're not. Now he's saying they're racially profiling. It's like he woke up one day and realized he's black. You know what I mean? Like it's. For me, it was it, it was almost insincere because when the community when the community that elected him that had conversations, so many people from my own community, we actually, even though we didn't agree with him on policy and, and everything, we still wanted we still wanted someone to represent us at the cabinet table, and unfortunately, he sold us out. And the second he needed help, that's when he brought up that issue. So, little disappointed there. Well. Actually, I'm not really disappointed. It's UCP at this point. You know what I mean? Like, I'm guessing for all of us now, this is just normal. <laughs> We're just waiting to see which next cabinet minister gets tagged. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, I can imagine it would be a big shock to to wake up one day and realize you're black. I mean, that's never happened to me. Uh, but, you know, if it was something you didn't realize before, I mean, like, he's how old, right? Like, that's the longer yeah. you go on not realizing something, the more of a shock to your system it is. Absolutely. Sorry, I interrupted you. Were saying something important? Oh me? Oh, no, yeah, I, I, I never say anything important. It was definitely you. Oh, I when don't I have it. a dumb joke, my eyes and ears just shut off, and I just kind of roll forward. So I think that was good for me, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, like it. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the 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 irony of a lot of things a lot of the time because I think that's uh, that's something that really sticks out 
um, in speaking to you is that, um, yeah, because I mean, you're, you were the, I mean, the, the youngest candidate in the city, right? Yeah. I think yeah, the youngest, I was actually the youngest person to contest in the 2023 election, 2020, no, 2021 election cycle. And I think quite possibly I was actually the youngest person to ever register to run because right. I somehow registered when I was 17. Okay. So what's called, uh, I still am looking into that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, because you're 18 now, right? Yeah, I'm 18 now. I'm turning 19 soon. Yeah. And I think like that's an interesting, I don't know, mirror to look into uh, because I mean, I can't speak for both of us here, but certainly me when I was 18, uh, I, and I mean this like truly emphatically, I was a useless piece of shit, just an <laughs> absolutely uh, awful human being um, uh, who, yeah, didn't really offer anything to anyone or care about much. So yeah, it's 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 kind of exciting and refreshing to meet someone who is like clearly already pounding the pavement for the stuff they believe in. When I was like, I don't know, throwing up on bouncers at Funky Buddha or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I guess like, um, but what? Yeah, what really sticks out like is your sincerity, your earnestness, your like how genuine you are and i don't know maybe you'll agree with me nicole but i find that almost like it's a bit it's tough to see because i don't know if you know this room but the world it sucks real bad um and really <laughs> yeah and you know like people like us you know we've been around the block once or twice or you know 46 times and we've, you know, developed our, our hardened outer layers and our defense mechanisms and, you know, most importantly, our, our sense of detached irony, which is, you know, what I was getting at in the beginning. So I'm, I'm curious if you've been working on your, your jadedness and your bitterness, um, which is, I think is so crucial to, uh, to caring about stuff. Hmm. Because if you're going to okay. get a head start on activism, you got to get a head start on pessimism. You know what I mean? You know, ironically, and this is something that may come as a surprise. Well, not really. Most people, no, most people who know me know this is that what's called. I think I'm actually one of the biggest optimists. <laughs> mm. uh, you know what I mean? For me, what's called, I had. You do not even want to know the first policy draft that we had. I swear it was it was a socialist utopian <laughs> right. fragment and so. I think, I think at the end of the day, for me, what's called, uh, I'm a very optimistic person. I, I what's called, I like to surround myself with pessimists uh, to kind of. You know, well, you've done a great job tonight. Yeah, but I think at the end of the day, you know, I mean, hey, if we're not having someone looking out into the world, being like, we can do that, <laughs> then who? How do we define what's possible? You know, what I mean, like, and and that's something that like, I, th I think a lot of folks don't understand about optimists is that I don't. I'm not someone that I don't think. I wouldn't say that I am, I wouldn't say that I'm like too hopeful, but I think at the same time, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm, how do I put this? I'm carefully optimistic. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to run outside with a ball and toss it in the air being like, it's not going to hit my head <laughs> in that sense. Cause like ironically, and you wouldn't think, but there are some people that, that I think, aren't careful when it comes to optimism and that's one of the and that's one of the bigger problems that we have too especially when it comes to politicians because we have politicians who are i would say carelessly hopeful and they promise outlandish things and unfortunately it doesn't come true so once again we got a community's hopes up high up high and we crush them so I always want to be careful, especially when it comes to that, you know what I mean? Because, like, once again, I don't want to be like Casey Madhu. <laughs> I, I love my community, so I want to make sure I'm making them proud. Mm -hmm. uh, just to backtrack a bit, are you telling me there's people who make promises during their elections, and then once they win, like, they don't follow through with them? Oh, God. Well, that sounds bad almost. That doesn't sound right. should elect those politicians. Mm -hmm. I feel like, like I feel like they would get in trouble or get yelled at or face some kind of accountability for that, you know? Ouch. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, accountability they... <laughs> Go ahead. I think the only accountability they can face is themselves. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, once again, I don't know if you remember, uh, Mr. Kenny promised 
and he signed the public waiver too. And you know, I mean, once again, any party that requires the the leader to sign a public health waiver is probably concerning. But nevertheless, so he signed it and lied. So <laughs> you know, I mean, like, mm, not the best track record. Hmm. <laughs> So if yeah. I'm picking up the subtle nuances here on the on the sort of pro anti Kenny camp, you're you're kind of leaning anti. Oh, a hundred percent. And once again, don't get me wrong. Uh, what's called, I think, at the end of the day, I think they're all horrible. But Kenny is special, you know. What I mean, like, and I think at the end of the day, what's called, and, and this is something a lot of people uh, defer on. Once again, I think if we're going to pay the lieutenant governor, I think she should be able to do something <laughs> like I, I think i think at the end of the day i'm starting to a little bit sick, sick and tired of figureheads uh i think at the end of the day if they have power they should use it you know what i mean like and at the end of the day i think at this point in time a majority of Albertans do not want kenny to continue and unfortunately the only way to remove kenny is through his own party right. and the problem too that even if we remove kenny we're going to get stuck with someone else you know what i mean we're, Probably get stuck with the uh, what's the guy's name? What's there's too many Jasons in that party. Uh, one of the <laughs> Jason Nixon. Too many Jasons in general. Let's be honest. Like yeah, we could one? we could do with fewer Jasons. Yeah, exactly. Richard, My God, could. especially in well, that party too. <laughs> Jason yeah. Nixon. Now, are you sure that this isn't just Jason Kenny wearing glasses? Because they look exactly the same. Ah well, if, if Jason Nixon starts talking, what's called exactly like Kenny? Well, no, for sure. <laughs> I guess, yeah. It's hard to tell with these guys. And, yeah, and you're saying like you're, like you're 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 not into figureheads? Like you're 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 over that? Me? Yeah. Uh because I got real yeah. bad for news for you about the, mm -hmm. who that lady on the money is. <laughs> I I I and once again, you know what I mean? Like I think I think it's better to have this discussion. You know, I mean, let's wait a couple of years. You know, what I mean, like, who knows what happens? And you know, what I mean, and once again, most likely, I don't think Canada's like. I, I don't think we can. I don't think Prince Charles. And once again, this is just me being a hopeful optimist. I hope Prince Charles is not on any other coins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you've turned into a terrifying robot. Yep. Oh, now is that just is that just me or is that you too? No, I it yeah, was me too. Oh, um, sorry, my bad. My headphones decided to uh, dip out. <laughs> no worries. But wow, uh, it's just, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I, that's great. No, you sound great. I'm just a little concerned that uh, your headphones are maybe being used as a listening device by Buckingham Palace, and they were just trying to like you know <laughs> cut your mic or eliminate you somehow. Ouch. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like. Name a single person member of that family that is not an upstanding citizen. But um <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've tried I'll real be, hard not to name one. I'll but... be honest. I'm like and once again, I'm kind of okay with Megan and Harry. Mm -hmm. I think I think they saw the toxicity and they're like, uh, nah, I'm good. So like I'm kind of like I'm sure. okay with them. I don't I don't mind them. Like once again, I think I think it's a little like this whole thing. UK runs in general it's just bad bad politics but mm -hmm. uh, yeah no uh, I think at the end of the day I hope to God that we don't see Prince Charles on a coin well I do agree with you although I would push back on uh, your point about now maybe not being the right time to talk about it because I think I think we're almost past that time considering the Queen definitely secretly died like a month ago and they've been covering it up but I honestly I don't blame I haven't has anyone seen her like in public alive Walking? Uh, well, I mean, the, the 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 fun conspiracy theory is that she's dead, and they're all like, they they were trying not to like shut down the country over Christmas announcing it. Um, but the much more compelling conspiracy theory that I saw online that I actually find uh, very plausible is that she had like a massive stroke, which is why they use that language about her entering a new phase as if she was some kind of like you know caterpillar, and. Uh, Oh. She, or maybe she's turning into a monarch butterfly. Hey, you're right. Actually, that actually makes a lot of good sense. That's one of the reasons why they can't bring her out. And if anything, who knows? Maybe Prince Charles is chilling, chilling in the back, making decisions now. Mm 
Wow. He's been waiting a long time, to be fair. Yeah. My God. Like, <laughs> imagine what's called. Imagine if Aaron O'Toole was left that long to wait. Mm. My God. Yeah. It's- Nicole, I hate to belabor the point, but can you deliver that punchline one more time when I talked about the queen uh, uh, transforming a caterpillar? Yeah, maybe she's transforming into a monarch butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> that's better thank you yeah they really hit different when we turned them down to 60 percent volume so uh yeah so that's uh that was uh soundboard corner we're gonna move on from that uh what are we talking about that is just insane i am still flabbergasted I, you know i actually never really thought about that yeah i didn't either but it, it kind of makes good, sense because it's good language too and why would they use that language Mm-hmm. Like they had to have been using that language for a reason, you know. What I mean, it's like mm. I honestly like, hmm, damn. Well, if I was Trudeau, yeah. I'd be like, can I visit the Queen? <laughs> yeah. Well, as a lot of people, <laughs> a lot more level-headed people have rightfully pointed out, is it's 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 absurd to think that um, you know if and when the Queen dies that they would be absolutely floored by it and unable to figure out how to proceed because they've almost certainly been like having meetings and like drafting up war plans for when the Queen dies for like 20 plus years now. Um, but something that's a little more unexpected is, well, what happens if this person is still alive, but now they are like, you know, they have a, a palsy in their face and they don't, they, for somebody who's so visible their whole thing is smiling and waving this person has an impacted ability to smile and wave uh you know now you can see why it'd be more like we got we got to hide her for a bit and figure out what we're going to do here because you know so much of that whole thing is image right yeah but yeah. i feel like that's kind of cruel in a sense you know what i mean yeah like, it's imagine- the rosemary kennedy thing exactly like i don't know like for me what's called like I want to feel comfortable dragging out my my 95 year old mother being like, "Come on, mom, let's go. You gotta take some photos in the crowd." You know what I mean? You can't mm. die yet. And like, here's the thing too. And I and I think and I think realistically speaking, I think most of the UK knows the second that Prince Charles takes over, that when that's like that's when the is it still called the Commonwealth? That uh, like we we are part of. Yeah, we're part of the Commonwealth, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's when the Commonwealth kind of falls apart. You know what I mean? Like, doomsday, that's when their money walks away. That's when the UK kind of loses its power. And the second the UK loses its power, uh, it becomes a... And once again, I don't think... Once again, this is just me hypothetically saying, is that the UK now reaps the be- reap, reaps what they sow. Yeah, they... I mean, I, yeah, you definitely get the... I, I think I agree. I think what you're saying is, like, I, I feel like I, like... I don't care about the queen. I don't particularly like her. I don't I really don't know anything about her because she just like, like Kelly was saying, she just smiles and waves. But I feel like she's been a figurehead for so long that we're just used to her now. And like, if she dies, we're going to notice. But if they're suddenly like, oh, this is your monarch now, all these Commonwealth nations are going to be like, "Mm, we were tolerating the queen. We're not ready for a new person. And that might be the point at which we like totally separate yeah. ourselves from them. And I think, and I'll be honest, I think that's for the better. Because once again, it has never made sense to me how one person can be the head of state for so many different countries. Trump must have been so jealous. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I mean, I do agree with both of you. Uh, I also think you underestimate the number of extremely weird people who are obsessed with royals in various Commonwealth countries. That's, that's uh, you know, fair. I, mean, I do have several teacups that I've inherited from my grandmother that um, have are like coronation things or like this is from the royal wedding and this is when the kid princes were born and like several like more like why do I have so many teacups yeah. with the royal family's face on them? Well yeah. and look at like a supermarket tabloid like it's despite the fact that we, you know, live in Canada, like the, all of the, you know, I guess like the Harry and Meghan drama you alluded to, like it's clearly interesting enough to enough people here that like, you know, 
Hello Canada as a very like specific localized magazine is going to devote every single issue talking to it. So I think it will be interesting. Um, how do you put it politely? Uh, when she finally kicks it, because the I think that response of hmm, maybe it's time to move on from this is going to come from like a solid 40 percent of people. <laughs> and you're going to have. Uh, a, an unfortunate number of people saying like, well, we can't, we can't stop having monarchs on our money. Like it's tradition. Like, you know, <laughs> well, I just finished watching, yeah, I just finished watching the crown. And if I learned anything from that, it's that we need more monarchs. Does anyone else have a conspiracy theory that the crown was created in order to like bolster support around the Royal family? Well, I'll be honest. That does make a lot of sense. <laughs> that's my, that's my thoughts on that. Is that they because I someone I didn't really think about it until someone pointed it out and it was just like basically their their point was like there's a lot of things in here that the royal family probably wouldn't have like revealed and apparently they've like asked the royal family about it and I'm like I bet you they probably like in the same way that like the military like fun like helped to fund was it I want to say Top Gun but like. You know, it was like, like any like major like action film that's about war is like probably a conspiracy by the American military to like bolster enrollment. But anyways, that's all. I mean, it's well, it's not a conspiracy. It's like literally a policy of if you want the U.S. military to provide you with like equipment for your movie, they have to like your movie. Uh, and you can you can look into pretty much any movie's uh, like um, production history of whether they got it or not. Um, I remember reading an article about a whole bunch of them and uh, like the reasons they would reject movies. Uh, like I think there was uh, I think there's a movie called like G.I. Jane where there's like a scene where she has to go like piss with a bunch of male soldiers and they're all uncomfortable and the military is like, well, we're not going to give it to you unless you take out that scene because we can't have soldiers looking unprofessional and like really petty shit. Um, the, the one that I very specifically remember was, uh, the movie Mars Attacks, uh, where like Martians invade earth and like all of the earth's militaries are hopeless to stop them. And they ended up, uh, I think they killed the Martians by like playing Slim Whitman music or something. And the, mu the, the military's like stated response for why they wouldn't provide financial support is you know, we can't we can't support a film that uh, is going to tell people that the U.S. military is like less combat effective than Slim Whitman. So <laughs> I wonder what they're I wonder I want to look up Tropic Thunder now and see if they got support from the American military. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. That is insane. Yeah, there's uh, um, I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't remember. I don't want to say things that aren't absolutely true, but I remember listening to people talk about there's sort of like a pipeline between people who um, like hold positions like high within like the U.S. Department of Defense and then also go to um, be paid as like at least creative consultants or like, you know, have production credits on like Call of Duty games. Uh, like there's there's like a direct connection between those things in that like the the U the Pentagon has uh, a vested interest in making sure that video games make like the military look cool uh and like that that's all out in the open like you can you, you don't have to to speculate about it there you you can see like who went from working for the government to working for these game studios so wow that sounds so cool it's cool and it's good yeah mm -hmm. this is this is how us uh us uh, jaded people interact with those things. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I definitely feel you there. I'm constantly looking for, and I mean to be fair, I was I am do consider myself an optim optimist, but I also am dating like a very I don't want to say pessimistic, but like definitely realistic person. Maybe a little pessimistic, and he's constantly looking. Like, have you guys played that new game, the Wordle? I haven't. I keep seeing it pop up on my uh, Twitter, and I'm like, I want to play it, but I am so, so, so unfortunately busy that I just want to get back and sleep. <laughs> That's fair. To be fair, if you're ever, if you ever want to play it, it takes probably less than two minutes to play, and it's only one word per day. So, 
Um, but it's, yeah, so it's a, it's a, basically a game where you like, you type it, it's a five letter word and you have six guesses to get it right. You basically, you guess a word, it tells you which of those letters are in that word. And you guess another word and you keep trying to guess until you get the correct word. Um, and Ryan's response to that is, I wonder who created this. I wonder if they're mining some sort of information from this. I wonder <laughs> if it's like a conspiracy to like make autocorrect better. Like he immediately was <laughs> like, <laughs> Which I mean, if that's the conspiracy, I'm on board because autocorrect stinks. But he was like immediately like, who is monetizing this? Why did they make this? What is going on? And one of our friends shared an article that was like, hey, some guy made this for his girlfriend because he thought it was cute. And Ryan was like, oh, <laughs> like, but that's honestly, it's where your head goes, right? It's, where's where's the money? Like, who's who's monetizing this? Who's benefiting from it? Why would you create this? Like, what nefarious purpose do you have? I mean, there are a lot of dark forces out there out to fuck with our spell checkers. Like, you know, that's been known <laughs> for centuries. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. pretty true. Mm -hmm. Although if we're coming, if we're cooking up new conspiracy theories, um, we we might say that uh, there's a cabal of people who are actively pushing to make sure that it's impossible to get all of your devices off of US English uh, and onto Canadian English, if it's even an option. Uh, so that we'll stop, you know, using British spelling and stuff like that. They want to take our way or extra use. Yeah, I'll be honest. I never understood why we just don't use. I think once again, like I, like I see no difference between color and color. You know, what I mean, like C L O like O U R and C L O C L O R. <laughs> like, I, I don't it feels wrong to spell it that way, doesn't it? Feels it wrong. Does. Oh my God, it does. <laughs> My God, I've been, I have been wowsy. <laughs> Listen, um, that extra U is my birthright. You will pry that extra U away from my cold, dead hands, okay? That's that's right. my position. All right, that, that like, seems fair. <laughs> I, I acknowledge that, and I will only, you will only ever catch me saying this once, and I'll say it right now, that American spelling is objectively better, but I will die on this incredibly dumb hill. Uh, I don't want it. I don't. I don't like their vibe, and I don't want their spelling. Just, just what if stop. it wasn't called American spelling? What? what if it was called Canadian spelling? But Canadian spelling, we like our U's and our centers with an R E. And but is uh, it really Canadian spelling, or is it British spelling? And if we're well, going to keep ties with the monarch, like you said before, should we actually be using their thing? <laughs> well, to me, to me, being Canadian is about being horribly confused over whether you do things the American way or the British way. And our spelling reflects that because uh, we, you know, like uh, I, I saw this pointed out once where in uh, in the UK, you would you would go take your car to like a tire center, which is T-Y-R-E and C-E-N-T-R-E. -E, and Americans would take it to a tire center spelled with an I and an E-R. Uh, and Canadians, of course, have to split the difference so that like, you know, switching my uh, spell checker to a UK English is like almost equally wrong. Uh, mm. And as Josh helpfully pointed out there, yeah, uh, you know, Canada is about splitting the difference in the work worst way possible. You know, it's like how you walk um, 10 feet, but you drive 10 kilometers. Like it should be baffling. It should be hard to remember which one you're supposed to do because that's that's all we have as a nation. <laughs> Just being confused. Mm -hmm. Confusion. I have this happen all the time. Like I'll be listening to Australians talk about like how weirdly uh, high the water in American toilets is. And I'm like, are we doing that? Or are we doing it the normal way? Like, and I, I like living in that land of confusion. Now nah, you confused me. I know. <laughs> Here we have, are our toilets weirdly full or empty? I, nope. There's no way to know. Now I'm interested in that. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to have to find out tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Foreigners also say American's bread is way too sugary. And uh, really? do we have that problem? Couldn't tell you. I don't think a bread. I, I ate toast this morning with eggs. So I think I can pretty confidently say, I think, well, actually, how would I know then? It's because that's, that's the thing. That's the thing about the toilets, too, is if you've never experienced the high volume toilets, how do you know? Or if you've never experienced mm -hmm. low volume toilets, what are our toilets like? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, those are a few things to keep you up at night. <laughs> my God, um, you have left me with more questions for myself than I did. <laughs> yeah. That's always our goal. 
because it's 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 fun often like when um you know when people make fun of americans for uh their like you know hilarious quirks and like you know their obsession with like calling their university their alma mater or uh i don't know what else what's the other weird shit is that do? just an american thing uh, I think too i know I, 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 Actually, ironically, this morning I met with the alma mater society of uh, UBC. So like, they're kind of like the student union for UBC. So hmm. I'm pretty sure. Actually, let's just BC weirdos because the U of A has an alumni association, which is also like pretentious Latin shit. But yeah. Hmm. But with that being said, like I mean, you could fill in the blank with your own example of you know weird shit Americans do that you get to laugh along with, but then. You know, sometimes you have to sit quietly when you. Uh, so one that came up for me recently was how uh, how weird it is that uh, Americans don't use the parking brakes on their automatic vehicles, and I was like, oh shit, oh no. Everyone here does that too, but it is like it is an insane thing to do in a way because the 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 thing that like holds your vehicle in park is like the tiniest little chunk of metal, and you should absolutely be using your parking brake. Um, and in, in some places, like it's illegal not to use your parking brake when you're parked, even if you have an automatic, but here everyone's like, fuck it. It'll be fine. I do have a, yeah, I do have a counterpoint to this. Um, I dated a truck driver for a while and his advice to me was because I always drive old, like beaters was that a, you can't trust your parking brake when you're driving an old beater and B he's like more than once I've gone to use my parking brake. And then because it's so rusted from all the salt and like wet and grossness that our roads have, it sticks on. And so then your brakes are grinding. And so what you're saying is you should maintain your vehicle. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is you should never use your parking brake. Oh, no, I'm not. That's, that is not a stance of the Let's show. Open up our next discussion. <laughs> <laughs> stance of the show. Never use any fe safety feature in your vehicle. Yeah, uh, I did want to ask. Yeah. <laughs> oh, seat seatbelts! Now that's a conspiracy. That's a, it's a conspiracy to make us soft. I went. I worked once with a guy that was convinced that um, seatbelts were actually more dangerous than not wearing one. Oh, mm -hmm. I have actually heard that a lot. Like masks, they, they hurt you more. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of folks have ironically somehow said that. I don't know. I've heard that from a lot of doctors too. You know, what I mean, like, and it's strange because I'm like. But the seatbelts? Yeah, they. I remember what's called the, um, I, and I can't tell if he was joking or not. But what's called? I was I was chatting with someone and what's called over Twitter, and they had a doctor. And the poor, uh, once again, this is Twitter, so probably not. But he was saying what he was trying to convince me how seatbelts damage you longer in the long term because they're compressing against you. And if you're, an, I don't know, but you know, what I mean, and mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day. <laughs> Hey, well, because <laughs> you know what doesn't compress you at all is flying uh, 100k through the air and hitting the pavement. Like, yeah, yeah. but that's com compressing you, you like can, laterally. If you get launched like, through the windshield, you have time to think about it and then tuck and roll when you land. You know, it uh, the the seatbelt <laughs> takes away your reaction time, and like that's your freedom, right? It's your freedom to decide if you want to like try yeah. to do a blade pose when you get ejected on the highway. Yeah, yeah. well, and you know that's um. The whole point of your windshield is not to stop the wind, like not to shield you from the wind, but to shield the wind from you when you go <laughs> careening into it. It stops you from going out of your vehicle, right? That's a safety yeah. feature in itself. So why would you use a seatbelt? It's a perfectly yeah. good hard piece of glass right in front of you to stop you from careening out of your vehicle. Exactly. Yeah. And at that point, why even have a windshield? Why not just have a steel blade there? And yeah. If you're wearing your seatbelt, you go right through. Yep. Mm -hmm. protecting, the, protecting the elements from you exactly yeah that's just see and that's just environmentally friendly is if you yeah, get into a car I'm, accident like it's as far as i'm concerned it's survival of the fittest if you get into any accident whatsoever like, like take you right out of it why don't we just make cars steal boxes yeah <laughs> on wheels <Well, Lilo's. laughs> i mean they basically are but yeah yeah. <laughs> um, yeah it's like i'm not trapped out here with the elements the elements are trapped out here with me you got it yeah, really, the seatbelt isn't protecting you from like the road and the other cars. Like the seatbelt is protecting the road and the other cars from me, because if I get my hands on them and you know my face and every other part of my body at the same time, it's going to be trouble for that, uh, you know, for that concrete. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Definitely. all that blood and flesh is probably going to be bad for it. It'll wear it away eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a long game. What it's an weird. interesting turn. <laughs> I don't know how we got here. My God, yeah, walk well, into the human and be like, these guys are talking about seat costs. <laughs> yeah, they're talking about yeah. safe importance of safety features on your vehicle. Uh-oh. Yeah. Well, the asphalt might be, you know, on paper stronger than one of us, you know, maybe, but hundreds of thousands of us, eventually we're going to wear out that road. And exactly. that's precisely why, you know, untold countless people die in highway accidents every year, because we have to keep up our war against the road. Exactly. And that's why conservatives say don't wear seatbelts, because then we're going to save money on road repairs. Actually, no, no. And actually, ironically, conservatives should say to what see, I'm so tired. <laughs> no, you nailed it. They're all very ideologically consistent. We should just listen to them. So exactly. I'm glad we finally came to that conclusion uh, after an hour. Uh, you've, you've won me over. Speaking um, of staunch conservatives, uh, we should bring out our guests or our GM. Bring out our guest. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I thought he was here. I'm also tired. Or apparently. is the real guest Josh? Who's <laughs> to